morning, church. Come on, let's rise to our feet. Guys, happy to be here. Anybody happy? <laughs> Praise God. Hope you guys are dry and uh, ready to receive. We're going to start off with a hymn. It's called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Anybody here to worship God? Anybody? All right, some of us. But come on, let's sing this hymn together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you know it, sing along. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in His wonderful face and the things of. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 it says this he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth the visible and the invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him and he is before all things and by him all things hold together amen church come on let's put our hands together for that god let's sing it together one more time turn your eyes upon jesus turn your eyes upon jesus turn your eyes upon jesus passage continues in verse 18 Jesus he is also the head of the body the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself were the things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross amen amen come on let's sing this out one more time turn your eyes upon jesus sing it together here we go turn your eyes upon jesus everyone together the in his wonderful faith. Leave this to this and the things of
Come on, sing it again. And the things, and the things of earth will grow strange, leading in the light of His glory and grace. Amen. Come on, church, put your hands together. Come on, we want to see you, God. Come on, bring the energy up, church. All right, church. And when we turn our eyes to Jesus, he gives us joy. Amen. So we're going to put our hands together. We're going to raise the energy because we believe that Christ is in us, that his light shines through us, and we're here to worship his holy name, church. So come on, let's put our hands together and let's sing out to our king. Salvation. Tearing through the dead of night See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light Freedom shaking up the atmosphere As the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears Come on, lift up your voice Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting word, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises. When we turn our lives to Him, there is joy and there is peace 
because he changes something inside of us. He changes our lives, he changes our thoughts, he changes the way we do things. And because of that, when we realize the greatness of Christ's impact in our lives, that's when we have nothing else left to do but just to worship him. So let us, amen, come on, let's give it up for him. So as we sing this next song, church, we're saying, here we are to worship. So that's what we ask. Just come in spirit and in truth and sing to your king. That is all that he asks. Sing it out together. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. That made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Come on, I think you guys know this. Sing it out. Here I am to worship. Every heart together sings. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, oh full of sin.
that song brought back a lot of memories we were younger and you know maybe a lot of us when we first came to know the Lord or really it was one of those songs that when we first loved the Lord um, it was on repeat in our hearts anybody else agree anybody else have those same memories great memories with this song man. really great song um, but I you know, us as a ministry, we could get loud real quick, you know. We could get very aggressive with our music and very, uh, I guess, somewhat emotional with our music sometimes. Uh, but man, I hope that this is not this moment. I hope that this is a moment where we kind of go back to our first love. Remember how we felt when we first fell in love with the Lord and when we first started declaring certain things. Sometimes we could go through the motions and sometimes even this song, after singing it for so long, for so many years, it could just kind of go through the moments. So I don't want to miss this moment, and we're going to sing the chorus one more time, and we want you guys to sing it, and, and we're all going to sing it to our God. But before we do and sing it again, you know, God wants to meet with you, and, and He wants to have a personal relationship with you, and, and yeah, so take 30 seconds just to personally, individually, just talk to God, and tell Him why you're here, tell Him what you're here to do. Um, just take 30 seconds, and then we'll sing this again together. so come on church because maybe you want to lift up your hands and sing to your God but this is your moment with your God for you to look to him and you to tell him and just 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 look to him right now and sing to him what you want to sing to him from the depths of your heart I would encourage you to sing these lyrics along with us that here we are God to worship you if anybody else is here to worship God and to look to him I would invite you to lift your hands to heaven as we sing this chorus again God we look to you right now you're the center of our affection, God. All right, come on, congregation, let's sing to him. Here I am. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to sing it again so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together Man, come on church, put your hands together for your God. Hallelujah. Welcome. Welcome to Elevate. We're so happy that you guys are here, that you guys are feeling good. You guys feeling excited. Hey, listen, take, take the next couple seconds, say hello to three people. Make sure that they feel welcome here at Elevate Church. Three people, three people, three people. All right, you all may take a seat and prepare yourselves for the Word of God.
How's everybody doing today? So good to see all of you guys. Let me tell you, Elevate Church, you guys are the real deal. You don't care how much rain, what snow, it doesn't snow, man, but whatever happens, you ain't missing. If you needed a canoe, you'll paddle your way to church. Ain't nobody stopping Elevate Church from letting Christ know that he is altogether worthy for us. Amen? So great to see you guys, man. Welcome, everyone, to Elevate Church. Man, if you're here for the very first time, we want to welcome you in a very special way. So Elevate Church, let's welcome our guests on the count of three, all right? On the count of three, we go one, two, three, come on. Welcome to all of our friends, our family members, our neighbors. We love to see you all here. It's great to see you all here. If you're here for the very first time, well, we would love to connect with you. There's two ways you can connect with us. You can fill out a connection card. It's in the backs of the chair in front of you. You can take a white card out, fill it out, or you can also do it virtually. Send us a text message. Text the word Go Elevate to 94,000, and we're going to respond to that text message with a link. You click on that link, and it'll open up a virtual connection card. Fill it out, and that will give us an avenue by which we can thank you for being our guest. Um, at the end of the service, we have prepared a gift for all of our first time guests. All you have to do to receive it is just go to the lobby and go ahead and um, show that, turn in that white card or show that text message and we'll go ahead and give you a free gift. It's our way of saying thank you for being our guest here today at Elevate Church. With that being said, let us look to God in prayer. I got a lot for you today, so I really want to take advantage of every second, all right? So let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, so much for your word. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our lives, Father. Father, thank you for your love and your work on our behalf. Thank you for willing to send your son, Christ, to pay the ultimate price on the cross so that people like us can have a second chance, that we could be right with you, God. If there's anybody here that's hurting, they've done some stuff, they've hurt some people, carrying some burdens or have been hurt, Father, I pray that they will know today that they can have a second chance. They surrender their life to you, turn from their sins, and believe in you, God. They can walk out of here with the forgiveness of their sins, eternal life in heaven. So, Father, I pray that that would be true of us today. We love you, God. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Church, give it up for our God. Today, we're continuing on our current series titled Among Us. We've been walking through the book of John. Right? The book of John is one of the Gospels of John. It tells us the whole story about Christ. We're studying the life, the death, the teachings, the miracles, um, and his life, his death, and his resurrection, all of Jesus Christ. We're studying it, and we're studying the book of John chapter by chapter all through Easter. And uh, man, today we're going to be in chapter six. But before we get into chapter six, I want to ask, I have a little riddle for you guys. Let's see if you guys can guess uh, what this is. What is something that we do every single day? We probably already did it once today in the morning. You're probably going to do it again right after you leave this service. And before you go to bed tonight, you're going to do this again. We can do it alone, but we prefer to do this with other people. And, uh, and, we, and most of our gatherings involve this. What are we talking about? Eating, food, right? You see, man, first I preached in Spanish today in the service, in the Spanish service, and they're super spiritual. They were like praying. I was like, man, you guys are oversaved. That's what I told them. You guys are, you're, you guys are too saved, right? So thank you. It, it was eating. It was eating food. And I told them, look, you kill two birds with one stone. You pray for your food, and then you eat. You did both, right? But anyways, um, yes, you're right. Food. We are food. We love Food. Food is important for us. We know that. We know that food we need for survival. We know that. But we have made food a recreational thing. I mean, think about this. You know, many people like cruising. I love cruising. What's the best part about cruising? The food, right? Maybe not so much anymore, but it used to be better. Uh, whatever. That's another conversation. Right? But food, right? What do we do? With the, we go to the movies, and before we go to the movies, where do, what do we grab? So popcorn, snacks, but they, that ain't enough for us anymore. Now we got to go to see the bistro and, and get a tomahawk, you know, steak and, 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 and overpay for that. And, and I hate that because you ever go out there, you can't see what you're eating. And you're like, <laughs> I take out my phone and, you know, making sure I'm only eating steak and, and no surprises on my plate. Now you guys are never going to eat there again. But anyways, you go to the ballpark and you're thinking, man, what am I going to eat at the park? I'm not going to eat dinner. I'll eat at the park, right? Everything involves food. We love food. Food even has its own network, its own channel, the food network, right? 
Man, it's, it's so important. How many of you love, raise up your hand if you absolutely love food, okay? Raise up your hand. Now listen, you know, you're in church. These cameras are linked to heaven. Don't lie in the house of God. We see your life group and we see the garbage after. You guys love eating. So raise up, if you love to eat, raise up your hand, right? Be real, right? There you go. All, all of the fit people are like, I don't like to eat. And they're right. You work out so that you can eat, right? But anyways, <laughs> man, we love to eat. You know, how many of you are eating breakfast? Be honest. You're eating breakfast and you're already thinking of what you're going to eat for lunch. Raise up your hand. How many are you? Uh, I'm one of those. That's a guilty pleasure. Man. I, I, on a cruise, that's what I'm doing. I'm eating cru- in, in the breakfast in the cruise. Like, where am I going to eat for dinner or for lunch? Right? On vacation, what are we going to eat? Is my next question. Happens all the time. How many of you are thinking about food right now? Raise up your hand. <laughs> I, uh, today I'm guessing that the bocaditos and the croquetas in the cafe are going to be gone by the end of this service because now I've made you guys hungry, man. Listen, we all love food. Guess what? Jesus loves food as well. I believe we're going to be eat, eating in heaven, so praise God for that, right? Jesus ate with his glorified body, so listen, um, uh, we're going to eat in our glorified bodies as well. But Jesus loved food too. He often ate with his disciples, And he uses food in today's chapter as an illustration to teach us who he really is. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now, I don't know how any Hispanic will not be a believer in Christ when Christ says, I am the bread of life. We love bread. Hispanics love pan. You know, you're the pan. That's my religion. Right? (laughs) I am the bread of life. Here's the big idea for today's message. Many come to Jesus for various reasons. But only those who demonstrate true faith by acting on what they believe about Jesus truly belong to him. I'm going to read that again. Many come to Jesus for various reasons. But only those who demonstrate true faith by acting on what they believe about Jesus, those are the ones who truly belong to him. Jesus says in John chapter 6 verse 47 And 48, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever what? Believes has eternal life. He says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, we pick up the story of Christ's life. He's by the Sea of Galilee. Let's read John chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Um, I'm going to invite you to open up your, your Bibles. If you don't have one, there's one in the bottom of the chair. Uh, We have English and Spanish Bibles there. I invite you to open up to John chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. This is what the Bible says in the beginning of this chapter. It says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following Jesus. Jesus was very popular at this moment. A large crowd was following him. Why? Why? Because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus was performing public miracles. He was healing people. Last week we talked about a paralyzed person who had been paralyzed his whole life. 38 years paralyzed and Jesus heals him. People are seeing this so everybody's flocking to him. And trying to find out what's going on and trying to get themselves healed as well. So they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Verse 3, it says, Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Jesus had been performing many, many miracles, and word on the street was, there's a miracle worker, and we need to go and check him out. Jesus became very popular very fast. Whenever you got someone doing David Copperfield is very popular, right? He was doing things, right? Magicians and stuff. Jesus Christ is on a whole different level. He's healing people. People who, who, who have never, you know, walked or walking, he's healing. He's becoming very popular. At this juncture, Jesus has a crowd of about 5,000 men, the Bible says. Now, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it, it, they don't frequently count women or, or children. So this crowd could have very easily been, if they had their spouse and a couple of children, and listen, they didn't have two kids like we do, right? <laughs> they, had, they had kids, right? They didn't have cable TV. They had kids, right? So here... What we're seeing, this could have easily been a crowd of 15,000 to 20,000 people. 
easily. Let me give you a little perspective. The former FTX arena, all right? <laughs> the former Miami Heat, the Miami Heat arena where they play basketball in, I still call it the AAA. They house, their capacity is 21,000 people. So the crowd that was following Christ was about the size of the FTX arena. Think about that. Now, Jesus sits on a mount with 20,000 people and he starts teaching. Here's where you see the parables and all this take place. And as he's teaching, it's getting dark. And Jesus graciously thinking about the crowds, he's saying, man, shouldn't we get something to eat? Like we're, we're, this crowd, who's going to feed all these people? And, and now it's getting dark. And then so the disciples kind of huddled up with Jesus. Like, what are we going to do? We're going to send them away. We're going to buy some food for them or whatever. And it turns out that this, and Jesus said, hey, listen, they found a boy who had a packed lunch, right? In this whole crowd, 20,000 people, there was one kid. There was one kid who had packed his lunch. And he had pretty much five loaves of bread and two fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish. In the crowd of all 20, the only one who had food was that kid. I think that some people were hiding food. They're like, I ain't giving my, my, I ain't giving my lunch away, right? I did that in school. I used to hide my food. I ain't sharing, right? So they only found one kid, five loaves of bread, and two pieces of fish. So one of the disciples brings him to Jesus, and Jesus goes ahead, and the Bible says that he prays, and he prays over the food, the five loaves of bread and the two fish. And after he's done praying, Jesus starts distributing the food to the crowd with the disciples. And at the end, all 20-something thousand people ate and were full, and they had 12 baskets left. This is an intense miracle. Jesus, out of a boy's lunch, feeds 20, he feeds the AAA arena with one boy's lunch. This is a massive, ma think of how much this would cost at $10 a plate. You're talking about $200,000 worth of food Jesus creates out of the thin air. That's God. Jesus does this. And he feeds. So the crowd see this and they are blown away. This is a huge public miracle. And the crowd started perceiving that he's a prophet. So right then and there, they began a political campaign to have Jesus as king. They wanted to force Jesus to become their king. He had 20,000 followers and they were all there and they were trying, they were talking about, man, this could be the king of Israel and Jesus, you could use your magic and you could do away with the Roman empire who was kind of, you know, oppressing the Jews. So they were trying right then and there to force Jesus for king. And Jesus perceiving this, he now wants to break up the crowd. It's not time for that yet, right? So he sends away his disciples, says, get on a boat, go and cross the Sea of Galilee. And then he retreats and he leaves and he goes up a mount by himself to pray and be with the Father. It's nighttime, crowd kind of breaks up, disciples are on the boat on the way, and Jesus is on top of a mountain. That night, while the disciples are going across the, the Sea of Galilee, there's a big storm that shows up. They're scared. And they see Jesus walking on water. So now Jesus just fed the crowds. He's walking on water towards them. He gets in their boat. He does a miracle. He stops the, the storm. And they end up in Capernaum in the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And that's where we pick up the story the next morning. The next morning, the huge massive crowd wakes up. And they remember Jesus. And like, hey, where's Jesus? They looked for him. They didn't find him. They were so desperate. They all got into boats. They crossed the Sea of Galilee. They all went to Capernaum, looked from there, and they found him. They found Jesus. Jesus movement. When Jesus sees this huge crowd crossing, you know, the whole lake to see Jesus, he sees this. He sees that his movement is building momentum. So when he sees them and he finds them and they're like, they finally found Jesus, Jesus at this moment sees that they're seeking him, so Jesus begins to break up this movement. This, he's becoming very popular. There's this big momentum building, and we want you as king, and Jesus wants none of that. So Jesus now begins to break down the crowd, and he notices that their hearts weren't real. So Jesus tells them, why did you find me? Why did you cross the lake? He says, you only seek me because I fed you. Not because you saw the miracle and you truly believe who I am. 
He goes, you're only here because you're hungry again. You only want another meal. You didn't shoot. He's God. He knows the hearts. You didn't come to, because you saw the miracle and you believe in me. And this is where the story gets interesting. Church, many seek Jesus. But not everyone is a true believer. This is what we're learning here. Many were seeking Jesus. But not, they weren't truly seeking Jesus as their Savior. And that's real of the crowds today too. Many seek out Jesus, but not everyone is a true believer. We're learning this in this story. All throughout history, crowds, millions upon millions have sought out Christ. Christ has had a massive crowd throughout history. And today we're going to break down the crowd and learn who are the ones who are truly saved in the Jesus crowd. So if you're taking notes, write this down in point number one. Point number one is this. Many seek Jesus for his benefits. Many seek Jesus for his benefits. John chapter 6, verse 25. Look what happens when the crowd found him the next morning. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Like, how did you get here? Weren't you on a mountain? You weren't on the boat with the disciples. They didn't know that he walked on water. He's like, I got this. You know, he walked on the water. How did you get here? Jesus answered them when he sees the crowd the next morning on the other side. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs, not because you believed and you saw the miracle and you believed, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You're just hungry, bro. That's why you're coming to me. You're just hungry. Jesus, knowing their hearts, he calls them out. And he asked them, are you following me because you saw the miracle? Many come for his benefits. That was true then, and church, that is true today as well. Many people come to Jesus for his benefits. So many people come to church whenever they're going through some hard time in their life. Oh, my marriage is struggling. You know, my wife filed for divorce. Let me go to church. Maybe Jesus can help us. Nothing wrong with that. We want you to come. But we ultimately want to pay, point you to the true salvation. Some people are like, hey, you know, my finances, you know, and my finances are hurting. I lost my job. Man, I, I can, let me go to the church. Maybe, maybe Jesus could do something. Maybe he could do a miracle. I've heard about that. If you give this or that. Sometimes when people are sick, they got a negative health report. And you're like, you know what? Let us try the church. Let's go see if Jesus could do something about that. Many come to Jesus when they have their needs. And they come to church for a while. And as soon as they get what they're looking for and things get better again, they take off. They're gone. They're done with church. Or maybe they came to church looking for something and they didn't really get what they were looking for. You know, money didn't miraculously appear. They didn't get the job that they were hoping for. Or the person they fell in love with didn't love them back. And, uh, and it didn't work out. They didn't get the healing that they wanted. And they're like, this God's not real, so I'm done. And they leave. This is the crowd that I call the self-interest group. They come to Jesus for their self-interests. They have an agenda. I need something from Jesus. And Jesus is treated like a genie in the bottle. Give me this or that. There's also those who add Jesus to their businesses in hopes that Jesus would make them successful. They open up a business and they'll put it in the bottom. I mean, God, we trust. God, I put your name in there. I'm doing this for God. They'll, they'll do an estimate and they'll be like, God bless you. Wink, wink. This crowd was doing exactly that. This crowd was saying, give me more bread so that we don't have to go out and buy it anymore. We want another meal. Can you do that thing again that you did, Jesus? We're hungry again, and we, you know, we don't want to go out and, 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 and buy this in the markets. You know, Jesus, can you meet our needs? Why don't you become our king? We want you to be our king so you can overthrow the Roman government. Can you take care of my needs? You know, use your magic, Jesus, and make the Roman Empire just disappear. You know, Jesus, why don't you set up a welfare state? Just, you know, provide. Be our king and provide for us. And just give us free food so we don't have to work. And you just provide for us food. This is literally what they wanted when you read the text. Many who come to Jesus 
Church, many who come to Jesus don't really want Jesus. They want what Jesus can provide. And this is a reality for many. Not all, but for many. That was a reality in this crowd, and Jesus knew it. So there's that slide. Many who come to Jesus don't really want Jesus. They want what Jesus can provide. And let me tell you, this crowd was very enthusiastic. It was a very large crowd. Jesus had become their hero. He fed them. And Jesus was discerning when he sees all this massive crowd, the amount of size of the crowd, and the enthusiasm. When he sees this, he's like, okay, I'm flattered, but he discerns there's something really wrong with the enthusiasm that they had. Something's wrong in the core here. Jesus knew it. And Jesus points it out, and he realizes, and he points it out to them. You just want more bread. You just want more food. But Jesus did not come to give them that bread. Jesus didn't come to give perishable bread, per- perishable bread for their perishing bodies. That's not what Jesus came for. He came to bring living bread for eternal life. Jesus, listen, Jesus did not come to die on a cross to pay our bills, to heal our bodies, to take care of our needs, to take care of... Jesus didn't come for that. I promise he came for something greater. The greatest need that we have is forgiveness of sin and eternal life in heaven so that no matter if you're broke or starving or sick, you'll be in heaven forever. Jesus came for the greatest need we have eternal life but they wanted the bread they wanted the temporal stuff now give me this bread and Jesus like I didn't come to give you that bread I came to give a better bread a bread of eternal life it was a very large crowd a very enthusiastic crowd but they weren't true believers and that's a lesson that we can learn too as a church in the Christian world church there's a slide large crowds and enthusiastic crowds does not equate to genuine believers let us learn that Man, there's large churches with massive crowds, much enthusiasm. You think, man, these people are going to heaven before me quickly. Doesn't mean anything. Many are attracted to Jesus for the wrong reasons. And because Jesus knew their hearts and that they were in the wrong place, Jesus begins to teach them what the true bread is. He tells them, I didn't come to give temporary bread. I came to give. Now Jesus, knowing that, He begins to graciously teach them again and tries to describe what this bread is all about. So he tells them in verse 27, he tells them this. He says, do not work for the food that perishes. Like don't struggle, don't go and and, and pursue, don't spend your whole life pursuing bread or money or romance or success. Don't work for the food that perishes. Those things, listen, trust me, when we die, none of that goes with us. Don't work for the food that perishes. He says, but for the food that what? That endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will what? Will? Remember that word, give. That's a gift. All right? The food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Jesus taught them not to pursue the temporary things, but eternal life. Which brings us to point number two. Point number one tells us clearly that many see Jesus for his benefits. That's the self-interest group. Point number two is this one. Many seek Jesus to try to work for their salvation. Many seek Jesus to try to do religious things or get a little, just enough religion in their life so that they can make it to heaven. I'm going to call this part of the crowd the religious. The first one is the self-interest group. Second group is the religious group. Jesus has just said that the food that endures to eternal life is given. Remember we talked about that? Given by the Son of God. The key word is give, gift. The very next thing they ask is this in verse 28. They said to him, what must we do? He just said, I'm going to, the Son of Man gives it to you. Then they said to him, what must we do? To be doing the works of God. They thought, I'm, I, do I have to do some kind of miracle too to get this gift, to get this eternal life? What must I do? And Jesus responds. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe. It's not about doing. You want to work? Okay, here's, this is the work that God is looking for. Believe. Believe in me. 
Believe in him whom he has sent. They were lo- looking for something to do to have eternal life. Many who approach Christianity are looking for things to do to get to heaven. This is the religious group. In the Jesus crowd, there are many religions. There are many different tribes. Even under the Christian umbrella, there are many denominations and, and different uh, forms of Christianity that, that are religious groups that are teaching that salvation is something you earn by doing good things. If you keep the law, you get everlasting life. You know, if you are baptized or if you take communion or if you're a member of the church or if you do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. If you do these things, then you get to heaven. Church, salvation and eternal life, what Jesus is talking about here is not earned by the religious things that we can do. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 clearly says that he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. The eternal life that they were seeking was found in faith. But they were saying, oh, what what must we do? And you know what? It's our human nature to believe that we have to do something to earn God's favor. We believe that God will work on our behalf if we do something. Oh, man, maybe if I go to church, man, God's favor will be upon my family. If I go to church, maybe we can find Christ and, and my family will have eternal life. Man, maybe if I give tithes and offerings at the church, if I give donations at the church, maybe God's favor will cover me and I'll, you know, he'll bless my family and he'll bless my, my marriage or, or, or my, my children or no Christ. Maybe if I serve at church and then they'll try these things, they'll come and they'll serve and they'll give and they'll, they'll, they'll attend church. And then they start thinking, man, why aren't things going my way? And when the things are not going their way, their way they give up. It says, forget this. When that happens to us, we have fallen on a trap of salvation by good works. You cannot win God's favor by doing something good. We cannot. You know what? You want to know what God wants? You know what God is looking for? Look at this slide. Jesus is not looking for workers. He is looking for believers. I'm going to say it again. Jesus is not looking for workers. The only work that will save you and give you everlasting life is the finished work of Jesus Christ when he died on that cross and paid for our sins and shed his blood. He already did the work. It's free. This bread he gives to us. It's a gift. Jesus is not looking for workers. He's looking for believers. When they hear all this, they can't believe it. They're doubting. The crowds are saying, what? So you say, I have to believe. Believe what? So it's like, okay, if you want us to believe, then what miracle are you going to do to convince us so that we can believe? Man, the nerve of this crowd to ask Jesus for a miracle when he just fed 20 plus thousand people out of thin air. Chick-fil-A's drive through can't even do that. And they're asking for a sign. He doubted again. 20,000 was not enough. And then they began to compare Jesus to Moses. Look how religious they go. They go back to religion. They say, hey, so you want us to believe what miracle are you going to do? Yeah, I know you fed us. That's pretty. That was cute, Jesus. But Moses, our father in the wilderness, he, he gave us manna from heaven, bread from heaven every single day for Many years. You just did this once to a small group. Moses did it to millions. And manna came every day for years. So what are you going to do? Moses' miracle is better than yours, Jesus. Look at verse 31. They said, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And here's where Jesus starts using bread. As a picture of himself. Look at how he responds to this. Verse 32 to 34. Jesus then said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. Moses can't do that. He's just a man. He says, it's not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father. Now, remember last week when he healed the the, the paralytic? When he said my father had a fit because only only God can call God his father? 
And he says it again. He says, Moses didn't give you that bread. It was my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And then verse 33, he says, for the bread of God is he who comes down. He starts describing himself as this bread. And he says, just like the manna came down from heaven, the son of God came down from heaven. For the bread of God is he, a person, who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread. You got a bread that gives eternal life? Give us this bread. Just like the Samaritan woman. You got living water? Hey, give me some of that water. They didn't understand it. They, they kept reverting to the physical. Give me this bread. And Jesus, in verse 35, says it clearly. You want this bread? Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. It's me. I came down from heaven to give the world life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Man, what a beautiful passage right here, man. This is one of his I am statements. When he says I am, this is Christ saying I am the God of the Old Testament. That I am statement, when that burning bush in the Old Testament spoke to Moses. When God spoke to Moses through a burning bush, he describes himself as the great I am. And Jesus in the New Testament, when he says I am, he's saying the same thing that Moses said, equating himself to the God of the Old Testament. He says, I am the living bread, the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger or thirst. This confused the crowd. You're the living bread? What do you mean you're the living bread? They're saying, Jesus offers up a type of bread that gives eternal life, and he's this bread? What? They didn't believe. Look what they said. Verse 41 and verse 42, it says, so the Jews grumbled about him. They started talking, and they're like, hey, what's going on here? He goes, they started grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. This is, he didn't come, Jesus didn't come down from heaven. You know why they said that? Because look at the next verse. They said, isn't this, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary, whose father and mother we know, they knew Joseph and Mary. So like, this guy's lying. His father's not God. His father's Joseph. We know him. He actually built my, my, my dining room set, at the carpenter. Jesus, you didn't come down for I know your dad. How does he now say I've come down from heaven? They didn't believe. In verse 47 and 48, Jesus says it bluntly. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of of life. The religious crowd wanted to do something and they thought that religion, what religion provided was better than what Jesus could give. They wouldn't believe that God came down. Which leads us to the third part of this crowd. True believers. Point number three is this. True believers of Christ eat the bread of life and have eternal life. I'm going to read that again because this is really going to get really, 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 really confusing right now. Some of you are going to be really confused, right? True believers of Christ eat. Everyone say eat. All right? True believers of Christ eat the bread, of the bread of life, and they have eternal life. Jesus now begins to further teach them what does it mean to believe. He tells them, I am the bread of life, and you have to believe. And believe what, right? And so Jesus begins to further teach them. What it means to believe using bread. Again, Jesus, the master illustrator, using another illustration, right? With, with, uh, with Nicodemus, he used life, giving birth, right? Being born again. With, uh, with the Samaritan woman, he used water. And now, here with this crowd, he's using bread. The master illustrator, Jesus now teaches them what it means to believe. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? He says, whoever eats the bread has eternal life. John 6, verse 51, look what he says. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Now catch this, church. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my, what, church? Flesh. Are you kidding me? He's a cannibal? I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I'm talking about is my flesh. 
You, if you're confused, imagine them. At this point, they're all, they are in a synagogue, a Jewish temple, teaching this. I'm surprised they didn't kill them right then and there. They couldn't eat meat with blood. They couldn't eat meat with flesh. Man, this is a deep teaching. Sunday school, I only learned about the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. You read more, it's like, oh, now I know why the Sunday school teacher didn't teach this. You got to eat the bread and, and you'll live forever and the bread is my flesh. The crowd doesn't understand. They were puzzled. What is this guy talking? Is he going mad? This guy's going crazy. Verse 52, they said, the Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and unless someone eats of this bread, they will not have eternal life. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm the bread of life, and whoever doesn't eat of my bread, of this flesh, does not have eternal life. What does Jesus mean? And here's where I want to clarify this for you guys. I'm going to break this as simple as I can. In this text, when Jesus says to eat of his flesh... And eat of, of the bread, which is himself. You know what he means? In this text, eating is believing. Eating is believing. If you truly believe that the bread is good for you, then you'll eat. Meaning, you're going to act on what you believe. So in this passage, every time he says, you got to eat of my bread, of my flesh, and all this... He's saying you got to believe. you got to take it in. You have to receive this truth. It's not just intellectual knowledge. you got to receive. you got to take it in. you got to receive Christ. Receive. This truth has to be part of you. Eating means believing. And I'm going to try to unpack that for you as best as I can. You, you know what I mean? True, true believing, true believers eat of the living bread. What does this mean? They don't just look at bread. This is all mine. I'm going to make a big burger and just... Amazing. This is what it means. Believing doesn't mean that you admire the bread. Oh, look at that bread. It looks amazing. It doesn't mean you compliment the bread. Hey, that bread looks great. It looks fresh out of a Publix bakery. It doesn't mean... It doesn't, believing doesn't mean just, I believe that the bread is there. That is not Believing. There are many people who believe that Jesus is God, who believe he's, he died on the cross and then he resurrected. But that doesn't mean that they're truly saved because eating, partaking, acting on that belief is, what, is, is the evidence that you truly believed. And many people believe in Jesus, but they're not partaking of Jesus. Let me give it to you this way. Let me give you this illustration this way. Let's say someone in the front row passes out. Boom. Passed out. Everybody's like, oh, and we have a doctor in the house, right? They show up, the doctor looks at them and kind of does the eye thing. They give them some smelling salt, you know. Somebody puts big beep pop or whatever, Vicks Vapor Rub, <laughs> and they smell it, and the person wakes up. And they, and they stand up. And after analyzing, the doctor says, hey, you know, this person, he's, he's dying of hunger. He's starving to death. And if he doesn't have something to eat in the next 30 minutes, he's going to die. So the person hears this from the doctor, right? If you don't eat in the next 30 minutes, you're going to die. So what do I do? I run, I go to Publix, and I go bring him bread, and I put it right in front of his face. And we tell him, do you believe that if you eat of this bread that you're going to survive? And he'll say, yes, I believe. I believe that if I eat this bread, that's what the doctor said. If I eat of this bread, then I'll live. But if I don't eat, I'm going to die in 30 minutes. I believe that. Do you believe that the bread can, can give you the nutrients to survive? Yes, I believe it. In fact, man, when I was a kid, my mom used to give me bread all the time. You know, and, and, and the carbs are good. You know, there there's carbs. It has everything and the nutrients. This is a healthy bread. This is a good bread. I believe that. And, but uh, do you believe? Yes, I believe that. In, and in tw after 29 minutes and, and 58 seconds, yeah, I believe that that bread could, it falls over and dies. Boom. He believed everything about the bread. He had all this knowledge about the bread. He ate it all his life. He was raised in the bread. Why did he die? He didn't eat the bread. It doesn't matter what you say about Jesus. You could have been raised in the church. You could have been, it could be 
the staple religion of your family could be Christianity. Doesn't mean you're saved. Doesn't matter what you believe about him, what you say you believe about Jesus. Doesn't matter how you were raised. Doesn't mean what you were hurt. Doesn't matter what church. You could live in a bakery. You could live in a church. But if you don't eat of the bread, then you don't truly believe. In this passage, somebody could say, I see it. I, you, you know what it means to believe? You know what it means to believe? This. This is what it means to believe. I believe that bread is good. <laughs> and I believe it has the nutrients for me. And I believe it's good, it's healthy. And I, there's evidence that I believe because I'm eating it. There's many people say, Jesus is the best thing for your life. He died on the cross. He said, well, yeah, you believe it? Okay, what actions have you taken in your life to follow Jesus? And it's not the actions that save you. Those are just evidence of the faith. The faith is what saves you. The actions prove it. And people who truly believe in Jesus, they act on it. Well, how do they act on it? They repent of their sins. They surrender their lives. They leave, leave their sins behind. And they put their whole life in the arms of Christ. And they follow him the rest of their life. They... They align their lives with what they believe about Jesus. Eating is believing. And church, let me tell you, and if you're visiting us for the first time, and if you never trusted Jesus, listen, time is ticking. And if we don't partake of the bread of life, if we don't believe in Jesus and, believe, and take in the teachings of, of Jesus and make them yours by acting on them and living by them, if you don't eat, you will die. Eating is believing. So let me ask this. Believe what? Okay, we, we know now. That eating is believing. But believe what? What do we need to believe about Jesus? Jesus brings more clarity to the crowd. Let's go to verse 53. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, I know, I know. Thank you, Sunday school teachers. I had no idea. Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you, he tells the crowd. The next verse, he says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. What on earth is he saying they were talking? They were like, this guy has gone mad. He's literally crazy. But when you understand that eating means believing, every time you see it, it means believing, it makes sense. Truly I say to you, Jesus says, unless you eat or believe in the flesh of the Son and drink or believe in his blood, meaning that our sins are washed away by his blood, then you'll be saved. That freaked out everybody in the crowd. They did not understand. They took it literally. They took it literally. They were saying, like, this guy is saying that we have to become can cannibalists or cannibals so that we can be saved. That was against Jewish law. They couldn't even eat meats or certain meats and they couldn't eat anything that had blood in it. He's saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood in the synagogue. Da loco. That's what they thought. <laughs> but when you remember that eating means to believe, it's to act on what you believe. Eating means believing. No one has ever, in, in the Bible, nobody ever ate the flesh of Jesus and never did anybody drink the blood of Jesus. So if, they, if it was meant literally, then nobody is saved. This is simple, it's clear. Eating means believing. So when he said, you must eat of my body, he's saying you must believe in my body, right? This bread is my body. And what he's saying is that ultimately in his body we have salvation. 
By him offering his body on the cross to pay for our sins, that is how our salvation, that is, he's teaching the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. He dies in our place. He pays for his sins in human flesh. By his flesh dying on the cross for our sins is how we're saved. So he's saying, whoever believes he eats my body or believes the salvation that's provided through the death of my body in the cross. And whoever drinks my blood, not really literally drinking, but believes that by the shedding of his blood, according to scripture, our sins are paid for. Whoever believes or eats salvation through his flesh and through his blood, that person is truly saved. That's what he means. Eating is simply believing. When someone, and I want to break, make this very clear, when someone believes that bread is good, they act on that bread. You don't have to ask them that they believe. They're, they're chowing it down. Ever, has ever happened to you, you know, it happens a lot to Hispanics. You're, you're eating a lot of bread and you're sitting down and, you know, your wife bought this bread for everybody, but you ate most of it. But they weren't there. They didn't know. And then your wife comes from back from work, happens to me all the time. She was and she sees me there with all the bread comes. Te gustó el pan, eh? I was like, how does she know? Because I ate it. When someone believes a bread is good, they act on what they believe in and they eat it. Let me tie that to Christianity. When somebody believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God to give us eternal life, they act on that belief and they repent of their sins and they leave them behind and they surrender their life to Christ and they follow Jesus. That's what it means to eat, to believe, to act on it, to align your decisions in your whole life to what you believe about Jesus Christ. So my question is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is a savior? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is a savior? And, and listen, the crowd probably clapped as well. But I really want you to really, 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 really know. Trust me with everything I have in my heart. Man, I want everybody that hears this gospel to believe. I want you all to be there, man. That's why I really want to double down here. Do you really believe? And if you have, my question is, how have you acted on that belief? What life-changing decisions have you made based on it? Because if you haven't acted on that belief, then you haven't ate. And if you haven't ate according to Jesus in this crowd, you haven't really believed. This was a very hard teaching for this large crowd. And you know what happened when they heard all this cannibalism stuff? The crowd abandoned Jesus. All 20,000 of them left. This, this guy's crazy. They all left. This was heartbreaking for Jesus. And I believe that in this portion of scripture, Jesus is heartbroken and he turns to his disciples after the crowd leaves and he tells his disciples, he goes, man, are you guys going to leave me too? And in a very special, intimate moment, I believe that Peter is encouraging Jesus. Peter responds in verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And verse 69, and we have what? Believed. You know why I know that Peter and the disciples believed? Because when Pastor Dan preached, he taught us, those disciples left their nets behind. Matthew left the tax office behind and his riches behind. They left their sins behind and they followed Jesus the rest of their life. Out of a group of 20,000 plus people, only the 11 disciples were real. And even amongst the 11, you had Jesus, Judas, which Jesus calls out. He's so one of you is the devil. Only 11 people truly believed. How do we know they believed? They, they dropped their nets. And they followed him. What evidence in your life, what transformation in your life is evidence that you have believed? How, have, how are you eating of the bread? 
What actions have you taken? Eating is believing. I want to end with this, this, this illustration. There was this guy who would walk the tightrope. And um, he's a big, he, you know, he was a very famous guy that walked the tightrope. And he had a tightrope set up over the Niagara Falls. So he had a big crowd. Everybody's like, ah. And he's like, and he would ask the crowd, do you believe that I can cross the Niagara Falls walking on this tightrope? And they're like, yeah, yes, you can. Yes. Okay. And, he's like, and the guy will go walk. And you'll walk over the whole entire Niagara Falls. When he got to the other end, they'll cheer like, yeah, we did it. We knew it. Yes, yes. And then he'll ask again, how many of you believe that I can cross the Niagara Falls on the tightrope juggling? Yes, you got We believe. So he goes ahead and he crosses and he does it all the way through. He goes, how many of you believe that I can cross the, the, the Niagara Falls on a unicycle? They're like, yeah. Yes, you can. He gets on the unicycle. He's there like, oh, and he goes all the way, you know, kind of playing around. Oh, I'm going to fall, yeah. And he gets to the other side, and they're like, yeah, you made it, yeah. And at the end, he shows up. He's like, all right, all right. He goes, how many of you believe, how many of you believe that I could cross the Niagara Falls holding this wheelbarrow? And they were like, yeah, we believe. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And he sets up. He's like, okay. He goes, who's first? Who's going to get in? Who's first? You believe it, right? Silence. <laughs> Eating is believing. And believing is getting in. When somebody gets in that wheelbarrow, they are trusting their whole entire existence, their life, on the person who's holding the wheelbarrow. When we come to Christ truly believing, we trust Christ with our whole life. Yeah. Our eternity. Church, Jesus is the bread of life. Whoever believes will have eternal life. Whoever eats of the bread of life will have eternal life. Eating is believing. It is acting on what you have believed. So today I want to invite you to trust Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior for the forgiveness of all of your sins and for eternal life. I am not asking you to, to believe some intellectual knowledge. I'm inviting you to get it all in on Jesus. Leave your sins behind and align your whole life and trust Him and Him alone with your life, with your death, and with your eternity. And if not Jesus, then who are you going to trust? I invite you to trust. Eating is believing. So I invite you to trust Jesus as your Lord and your Savior for the forgiveness of all of your sins and for eternal life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this truth. I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, I pray that they would believe today and that they will get in and trust you with their whole life. With your eyes closed your heads bowed, I want to explain the gospel and how we're right with God. It starts off with the problem. The problem between God and man is sin. And the Bible says that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the problem. We're sinners. I'm a sinner and we're all sinners. The problem gets worse. The Bible says not only are we sinners, but there's a consequence for our sin. And that consequence is death. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, that the payment for sin is death. Death in the Bible is separation from God for all of eternity. The only place separate from God in all of eternity is hell. That's what my sins deserve, and that's what all of our sins deserve. But here's the greatest news of all time. It doesn't have to be that way. God has sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You have to believe. Christ came and he died on the cross. The payment for sin was death. Jesus paid it for you. He died on the cross in his flesh. With his blood, he shed his blood to pay for your sin. It should have been our flesh. It should have been our blood because we're the sinners. But he took it on in our place because he loves you. He dies on that cross so that you can have everlasting life. His death pays off all of your debt of sin, forgives you, 
And now you are made brand new. And now you can be a child of God and a citizen of heaven. The only way to receive that is by believing. And believing means that we act. The Bible says repent and believe. Repent of your sins and believe that Jesus paid it for, for you on the cross. So I today invite you to trust Jesus as your Lord and your Savior for the forgiveness of all of your sins and for eternal life in heaven. In a couple of seconds, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that decision. I'm going to ask you just to raise up your hand, and then we're going to pray. So here it is. If you would like to trust Christ as your Savior, believe in him, put your whole life to Christ, surrender everything to him, and follow him. To trust him for your salvation, for the forgiveness of all of your sins, and for eternal life. If that's a decision you'd like to make today, just raise up your hand. I just want to pray for you real quick. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see another hand in the back. Awesome decision. God bless you. I see another hand over here. Anybody else? Just keep them up. I just want to, I just want to acknowledge you. Anybody else? Just raise up. God bless you. I see a hand over here. God bless you. I see two more hands over here in the left. God bless you. I see another hand here in the back. God bless you in the back. I see your hand. Best decision ever. God bless you. I see your hand as well. Anybody else? Over here, I see your hand. God bless you. Best decision you could ever make. Anybody else? Anybody else? God bless you. I see your hand. Listen, don't trust religion. Don't trust that you come to Elevate Church. You could be a pastor on staff and never really got into the wheelbarrow. You could be a Christian your whole life. Your family, don't trust that. Christ is the living bread. Believe it. Take him in. Receive him. And build your life on that truth. Anybody else? Just raise up your hand. I just want to pray for you. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. See another hand over here. This is what we're going to do. We're going to pray. If you raise up your hand, I invite you to pray this prayer. The hand doesn't save. The prayer doesn't save you either. It is you calling out to God, placing your faith. Use these words as your words. Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I am a sinner and I don't deserve heaven. But I believe that Jesus lived and Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins and on the third day I believe that he resurrected and Lord based on what I believe about Jesus I repent of my sins and I surrender my whole life and I place it in your hands I am yours Give me your Holy Spirit and help me to live a brand new life for your glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, church. Give it up for those individuals who made the best decision ever. Church, what a more fitting time than now to celebrate communion. So we're going to take a couple of seconds to take communion. If you're um, in the front, the ushers will give you a communion cup. And if you're here, in the, the chair in front of you on the bottom, there's, there's some cups there for you. Communion in our church. We, uh, we ask that people that take communion are saved. You've trusted Christ as your Savior. And that you have been baptized. That's what we ask. The Bible makes it clear that communion is for those who are followers of Christ. And those who are in good standing. The Bible gives some severe warnings of misusing communion so that's why we put those parameters to guide you so I want to go ahead and read what the Bible says 1 Corinthians 11 23 to 29 says for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me keyword remembrance of me in this manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me and I want to be very clear elevate church there are many Christian denominations that tie today's passage what we talked about eating and drinking of the flesh and the blood of Jesus, they connect it to communion, what we're doing now. 
And it kind of, when you look at it from face value, we see, oh, there's a connection. You know, the bread is the body and the cup is the blood. And there's many under the umbrella of Christianity that they teach that what Jesus meant in that passage that we studied today is that we literally have to eat the flesh of Christ and that we have to drink the blood of Christ. And that the way that we do this is through communion. And they believe that in communion, the bread literally turns into the flesh of Christ and the cup turns literally into the blood of Christ. And they believe that communion is a necessary step for salvation because the only way to get to heaven they teach according to how they interpret today's passage is that you have to eat the flesh of Christ and drink his blood so they do communion even every single week they'll hand it off and they'll say the body of Christ the blood of Christ they believe and they teach that the bread and the, the turns into the flesh and the blood at Elevate Church, and, and we do not teach this. We do not believe that this is what Jesus meant. Case in point, when Jesus instituted communion, Lord's Supper, that night with his disciples, the very first time this was done, and we're supposed to model after, Jesus did not feed his literal flesh to his disciples. He could have, like let's be real, he was right in front of them. They could have literally eaten of his flesh. But he didn't, he grabbed a piece of bread and he says, this is my body as in commemoration, in remembrance of my bread, of my body, this is my body. It's in commemoration, is a picture, an illustration. He could have literally given them his flesh. And trust me, he was going to be tortured after that. So a couple of bites wouldn't have hurt compared to everything else he went through. Like, I want to be very blunt and real. He did not cut himself and put, pour some blood in cups and says, this is my blood, which is the new covenant. He did not do that. He took the cup. So Jesus in the Lord's Supper did not give, feed flesh or blood. Nobody in the history of Christianity or the world has ever ate of the flesh or the blood of Jesus Christ. That is not correct teaching. Eating simply means believing. And communion is to commemorate, to remember that our salvation, that we never forget that salvation took place through the body of Christ crucified on the cross and that our sins are washed away through the blood of Christ. And then we partake of the bread as a picture of the body, but in commemoration. And we drink of the cup, not blood, in commemoration. So in commemoration of the body, the Bible says that Jesus took the bread. I'm going to invite you guys to pull back the plastic lining and take up the bread. And the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, not flesh. He took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In remembrance of me, partake. So in remembrance of his body, let's partake of the bread. The second element is the cup. The Bible says, then he took the cup, not his blood, the cup. He gave thanks and he offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In remembrance of me, partake. In remembrance of the blood of Christ that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, let us partake of the cup. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, God, so much for what it is you're doing in our lives. Thank you, God, for sending your son. Thank you for your body and the blood that was broken, sacrificed, and shed for us. God, nobody in this room will ever offer their son to die for anybody else. But that's exactly what you did. We believe it, we receive it, we take it in, God. And by belief, we mean we act and we surrender our lives, repent of our sins, and follow you all the days of our life. We love you, God, and we know that you are our king, and one day you will reign on earth. And to then, we will praise you and make you known. We love you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Church, give it up for our God. Good morning, Elevate Church. Bro, I'm going to take a bite of this right now. I want to thank our sponsors for today's sermon, Ace Hardware, ladies and gentlemen. No, hey, listen, welcome home to Elevate Church. We have just a couple of quick announcements, and I do mean quick, so don't skedaddle just yet. Number one, if you're a first-time guest, and number two, if you just raised your hand to trust in Jesus, man, do not miss this part. Look at the chair in front of you. There's our, there are connection cards. Grab one and quickly fill it out. At the bottom, it says, commit my life to Christ. If you check that off, and as you exit, immediately to your left, we have our connect team there. They would love to connect with you. They want to give you the first steps on your journey. They want to be able to tell you what your next steps are. So don't leave without stopping by, getting the information, and getting your free gift too. So do not leave. Elevate Church, in the lobby, we have a ginormous, and I mean <clears throat> ginormous baptism sign. We are having our first baptism of 2023 happening on March 5th. So if you've made that decision to trust Jesus, but you haven't taken your faith public, I highly urge you to register for the class. Go there, fill out the paperwork, and sign up. We will have a baptism class explaining what baptism is, and then we will prepare you for March 5th coming on up. Now, before March 5th, I want to talk to you about February 11th. Febu February 11th, we are having Love Day. Make some noise if you're going to Love Day this year. Yes! Do not miss this. We are going out into our community and we are going to be sharing the gospel. We're going to be going and cleaning the streets, feeding our heroes, restoring some of our local schools. You need to be part of this. If you're not connected to a life group, that is the number, way, number one way to connect to Love Day. But if you're not connected to a life group, please stop in the lobby and talk to our connect team. We want to be able to give you the information so that you too can register and hit the streets with us on February 11th. It is going to be in an impactful day. You do not want to miss it. But you know what's happening today? Today's the first Sunday of the month. That means that it's Journey Sunday. So right now, after this service, about 1230, we have Journey with our friend Diana. Diana, stand up and wave. Yes, Juan, stand her up. Stand, look, there's Diana. She's going to be leading the journey. That is the welcome class to Elevate Church. That's your first step to becoming a member. It is a peek behind the curtain of who we are as a church, what we believe in. So make sure you stop in the lobby and look for the sign that says journey starts here. Last but not least, I want to pull some ears. For those of you parking on the sidewalk, come on now. We don't want the neighbors angry, do we? So if you guys are kindly parking here, don't park on the sidewalk. You will make Greg a happy man. But you know who's a happier man? Team Player of the Week Church. As loud as we can, give it up for the friendly face in the lobby, Mr. Julio. <laughs> Julio, we thank you, brother. He is coming now to our 1230 service. So if you know him, don't tell him anything yet. Let's keep it a surprise and let's embarrass him here next service. Let the church on our feet. Let's wrap this service off in prayer before I eat this bread. Dear God, thank you, Father, so much for who you are. And Lord, thank you, God, for this church. Thank you, God, for the worship. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you for the people, Father. Thank you for the family. Thank you for the fact that you um, died on that cross for us, Lord, and you have called us to drop our nets and to go all in. So God, help us put people in our path this week that we can share the gospel with them. Lord, thank you for the tithes and the offerings. Thank you for Julio and his ginormous heart, the way that he loves and serves you. God, we love you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we all say amen. amen. God bless you, church.